Well, greetings to all of you here today joining online. Thank you so much for your interest and for your presence. The session is an effort to mainstream intersex issues across the debates on HIV and sexual rights matters. And here it's my suggestion for today's meeting. I would like to share some thoughts and ideas I have articulated around intersex issues in my work, activism and research. Once I finish my 30 minute presentation, uh, we proceed to a Q&A interaction in order to address any questions you might have in the remaining time. So let me just very quickly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Vida Guzul, my pronouns are she and her. And I'm an intersex person and travesti trans woman. Uh, and I am currently, currently working with Kate as an intersex program officer. And although the presentation name is Intersex People and Sexual Rights, I believe it does not represent what I expect exactly accurately to discuss with you today, but I will I will make my, my effort. Actually, when preparing my presentation. Uh, I asked myself how I could convince, I could persuade you, my audience, about the urgent, urgent necessity to include intersex people in the core of the responses and efforts when it comes to address sexual and reproductive health and rights gaps. And I recognize many responsible and timely endeavors towards the protection, promotion, and fulfillment of sexual and reproductive rights in all levels. Yet, it's my opinion that even once we have accomplished all the goals we are now discussing within a section and reproductive health and rights debates as they are today, we will not be able to say we achieved sexual and reproductive health and rights for all. And we cannot say that mainly because intersex people remain at the very margins and the missions of that conversation. In case it remains a reality for our agenda, intersex people is going to face persistent abuses and violations of their human rights. And there is no sexual and reproductive health or rights if we keep leaving intersex people behind. So how am I intending to convince you about that today? Today, I'm not talking about any UN human rights declarations or recommendations. I came all the way all the way here from Brazil, and I would like to bring some real stories of Brazilian intersex people. I hope they will inspire you. I bring today narratives I collected in my research, and I hope these to work as borderline cases to inspire our responses to the health and rights gaps faced by intersex people in order to inspire you all to commit both individually and collectively with an effective, inclu inclusive human rights approach towards intersex populations, intersex groups, intersex people. And to me, speak about Brazil and Brazilian intersex people is not, is not just an easy way to, that, to, to do that, nah, nor pure patriotism of mine, but for an attempt to raise awareness on a very complex environment, a third world global south territory, well known by its its huge inequalities and it's a story in, of very violent colonization. So here is my effort to conduct that discussion in geopolitical oriented terms. So, uh, so sorry for tracking it back so long time ago, but I started my timeline in the 17th century when the colonial enterprise starts uh, as the first multinational business in my home country, Brazil. A contentious anthropology, I mean, one attentive to the intersex demand, considers the colonial state of affairs, its practices of gross abuses and violations of the human rights of intersex people. I mean, the literal multilation, the fetish for the denied access, for the unconsented possession, and intersex issues in the colonial political economy of Brazil was and is regulated according to the best interests of our metropolis. In, and in the colonial time span, which is in Brazil is from uh, 1,500 1, 1, 1, 1, uh, to 1822, the European metropolitan mentality 
sought to deliver a very Christian truth. And I bring that story of Yves de Vreau, uh, who's a who was a French religious and entomologist, a Capuchin friar who was part of a French expedition to colonial Brazil. Uh, and he narrates in his, in his history of the most memorable things happening in Maranhão in the years between 1613 and 1614. The execution of an hermaphrodite indigenous man called Tibira because he had a female voice. And Evro narrates that Tibira, which is who was that indigenous um, person of the Tupinamba people. And Tibira has been taken to a cannon, like that giant gun. Uh, one of uh, the cannon was at the wall of the San Luis Fort. And Tibira was tied by the waist of, of to the to the cannon. Of, uh, to the gun, and the gun was fired. And once the gun was fired, in the presence of all important people from the city, uh, and well, Yves de Vreau narrates that savages and French people were all present at the moment. At, at the moment the gun was fired, the bullet immediately divided the bar into two por por portions. One of which fell at the bottom of the wall of the San Luis Fosch and the other into the sea where it was never found again. And I'm so sorry, I, I, I presented um, I present a so violent episode, but uh, I mean, it represents very literally how people, how the world treats us when we are not able to, to attend to, to attend the dimorphic sex, this truth of the dimorphic sex. They would be able to put us in a gun in order to divide us in two, you know. So the next story, let's see two other stories dating from the late 18th century. A study of the charges filed in the Minas Gerais uh, attorney's notebook from the Inquisition collection in Lisbon reported the case of Manuel Rodrigues Pacheco. Manuel was initially charged in 1795 as guilty of sodomy. And during an investigation, Manuel was once again denounced, but this time he was qualified as an hermaphrodite and subjected to a medical examination by two surgeons in the presence of the judge. And this calls my attention because you know, you, we can see uh, doctors, medical teams, and, law, and, and judiciary teams working together in order to regulate intersex issues in the colonial span period. So in another village uh, in Ouro Preto surroundings also, uh, Francisco Xavier Braga has been charged, charged as an hermaphrodite due to the prevalence of the female sex in his body. And I mean, this effort to historicize intersex, intersex issues and the human rights of intersex people, as well as their persistent violations in a colonial context, I mean, allow us to identify a problem that lies as, at the very core of the human uh, and body inscriptions. How, what we take for a body and what we take for a human being, you know, and how it's related, uh, how it, that kind of uh, ra rationality uh, has its basis on on sex on sex characteristics, uh, but I do believe it also helps us to identify forms of resistance towards changing this referential. And I will bring some examples just to. Well, my 200 years later, I will jump for to I will jump to 1980s, and the story virtually had the story hadn't virtually changed it. I bring the story of Carolina Yara, who was born in Sapopemba, which is a peripheral area of the city of Sao Paulo. 
And she's an intersex person who says that no explanation about intersex traits or hermaphroditism, because you know, hermaphroditism is a very well-known category in Brazil, and people don't actually know uh, what intersex what intersex issues are, but they will probably know uh, about hermaphroditism. But even uh, what Carolina Yara says, she she and her, her family didn't receive uh, information even about hermaphroditism and uh, once she was born. And she states there had been only one comment from, from the medical team, the surgery. And not just one, but three surgeries over the course of 12 years. And she says there is nothing capable to repair or compensate the very, very harmful outcomes related to all that she has been through. And on her own words, nothing can make me forget the tubes, the black colored bandages wrapped around my manufactured penis, the many stitches in my genitals. I will never forget when the catheters were introduced in, into my genitals without any local anesthetic, without any painkiller. And by that time, Carolina was six years old and she says she couldn't play with the other kids for an entire year. So I, I, will, I, will, come, I will jump to the 2010s and the 21st century came with no news for us. Uh, Lia Ribeiro, uh, a person who I interviewed for my master's research, Lia Ribeiro told me that doctor, that the doctor from the University of Sao Paulo's General Hospital gave him hormones without his knowledge, without any comprehensive information. In fact, uh, he calls attention to the fact they didn't even tell him he, he was receiving hormones. And he, uh, I quote him, doctor said, take this medicine here or you will become an hermaphrodite. And that's how, how it went over 11 years of his life, which is the period when he received hormones despite his consent. And throughout this, his journey, navigating uh, in healthcare services, Lia says um, that he and his, mo his mother went through very, some very painful traumatic episodes when he find really difficult to listen to the things uh, people told, especially as a child with an alleged pathology. And I find it curious when he brings the paradox about the struggle of trans people demanding hormone therapy in the Brazilian public health system, while he underwent compulsory treatment, uh, he didn't even want to. So, uh, very, very representative of the disproportionality we face uh, in Brazil in terms of uh, how we can access healthcare services, right? So I would like to bring also some aspects around the backlash effects and the political crisis in Brazil. Well, people uh, talk much, lots about backlash effects, and uh, I believe Brazil is a very, very great example of uh, how we were dealing with that. Uh, because the reactionary moment on the way since 2016, considering the coup slash impeachment of Dilma Rousseff, the assassin, the murderer of Marielle Franco, who's a who was a leader, a LGBTI leader in Brazil, and the election of Jair Bolsonaro has certainly impacted intersex movement and the lives of intersex people. Uh, Lia says, I quote him, I remember when Bolsonaro was elected, uh, I was with a friend of mine who's a travesty, and we were in the street and we had to find some shelter because cars would drive by and throw things at us, you know? We, are, we were in the street and then one of the guys hit us with rocks and it was five o'clock in the afternoon and this violence that we were already experiencing seems to have been legitimized. So when it's legitimized by a larger sphere, 
who am I to say that you can't hit trans intersex people in, with stones, right? When the federal government is actually saying the contrary, that you can hit us. So, I mean, I, I can understand it because people sh must fear us so much because sex variations and intersex issues has the potential to counter narrate this biological litany these movements insist to advocate for. But the co this context was in parallel with the very own emergency of the intersex network in Brazil, I mean, the intersex activist network in Brazil, and resulted in its invisibility in the public space, but uh, in general, but also uh, in the hegemonic framings of the LGBT network, as the intersex network was one more network among like indigenous movements, uh, black movements, one more network among those uh, that remained at the margins of the state society dialogue. And at this point, actors in the emerging intersex network work it alternatively through online interaction media in order to create support and socialization groups for intersex people and means to outreach the general public in order to raise awareness on intersex issues. But for the LGBT network uh, in Brazil, the suspicion regarding institutional politics and the, and the and after the participatory project of the Workers' Party government, the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff in 2016, Jair Bolsonaro in 2018, these all have resulted in a profound diversification of the ways of doing collective action in the LGBTI field, including the very emergence of intersex subjects for that network. So, I mean, interesting, it, it's in the context of crisis that the intersex network assumes increasing relevance and public influence, including the creation and formalization of the of associative devices and advocacy groups of intersex people, the increased uh, the increased importance, relevance of intersex issues in in the public debate, in academic and activist circles, and the intersex insertion in popular and state society fora, in addition to increased cooperation with other actors, such as political parties and other social movements. So contrary to the expectations, the following years, after 2018 especially, I consider the most productive for the intersex network act, for the network of intersex actors. And these actors narrate that the period after 2016 consolidated important symbolic milestones from, from the, for, for the network. The confirmation of the social, the conformation of the social movement, the formalization of the interest of a, 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 a associative device for intersex people, which is the Brazilian Intersex Association, which I was part of, and the election of the first intersex parliamentaria of, of, in all South America. I'm, and I mean, I'm not saying that political crisis is good for us, not at all, but it does bring a kind of ideational contestation and some kind of reassessment of the ways of doing, of the repertoires of interaction that was beneficial to the intersex network in order to, uh, to enter the hegemonic uh, network of LGBT actors, very heterotary to, to, to intersex issues, especially because this kind of biological thing people, ha people f think about us, right? So before I, I talk about COVID-19, I would like to bring some, some considerations about HIV and inequalities. Uh, well, I mean, we are at the AIDS conference, so I'd like to talk about it because it's not like a very obvious nexus. So, I mean, decades of evidence, and this is a quote from the new global AIDS strategy, uh, Decades of evidence and experience show that inequalities are a key reason why we are missing the 2020 global targets, right? And 
inequalities spin, uh, underpin stigma, discrimination, and HIV-related criminalization, enhance people's vulnerability to acquire HIV, and make people living with HIV more likely to die of AIDS-related related illnesses. So if we are uh, uh, working with inequalities as a core concept of, of the HIV response, we should take a look on intersex on, on the inequalities intersex people are facing, because uh, and I bring that uh, that report called "A Long Way to Go for LGBTI Equality," and decades oh sorry and across the European Union, intersex respondents indicate the highest rate in the majority of research aspects like physical or sexual attacks, life satisfaction discrimination, harassment. This survey uh, shows that at least 60% of intersex persons, or of intersex people, undergo surgery before they or their parents can give consent. 50% uh, of them are given hormone before they or their parents can give consent. More than a half, 55% of intersex people who responded to that survey have anxiety anxiety and depression. And I mean, this is not any new to the LGBT acronym, but this 55 prevalence is the highest among all disaggregated L, G, B, and T letters. And about 6% of respondents had experienced discrimination, which is also the highest rate among L, G, B, and T populations, even higher than for the trans population, which in the survey was 55%. And the survey also reveals that experiencing physical sexual attacks is more common for trans and intersex respondents. 70% for trans respondents and 12 and 22% for intersex respondents. And compared uh, with the average for all respondents, which is 11%, intersex people has, the, has twice the chance to experience physical and sexual attacks. And despite the success, uh, oh, and there is another interesting uh, element of that. In Australia, uh, Morgan Capter has conducted a, stu a study, which is the intersex stories and the statistics of, from Australia. And most participants, 65% said their variation uh, intersex variation or related treatments impacted on their sexual activities. And while it's most found current sexual protective um, devices adequate, some did not. And we will need to pay attention to the 14% of respondents that had contracted STIs, for example. So uh, despite the successes, AIDS remain an urgent global crisis. And we are taking a look at inequalities as a core concept in order to respond to HIV AIDS and other sexual and productive health and rights matters. We should take a look into inequalities intersex people are facing because we are very, very affected community. And if that's true before the pandemic of the COVID-19 pandemic, I mean, even more now, uh, we because COVID-19 has created many, many constraints and shortcomings in order to, to respond to, to HIV and also in order to access health and reproductive, uh, sex, sex and, sexual and reproductive health care services, for example. And I bring those reports from OII Europe, from the Intersex Asia and from the African Network, uh, of intersex people, they all narrate a very, very uh, difficult, complex context. And one of the most critical founts they all present is the highly increased risk of intersex people not being able to access financial support uh, with a story of, of a history of discrimination at workplace and inability to gain employment, the high percentage of increased mental health issues amongst the respondents, uh, and many other barriers like education, appropriate education, or psychological support counseling. So 
I mean, what I call your attention, my recommendation here is about the relevance of, I mean, I've been in several spaces and people would, would be saying like, oh, we can talk, we can really talk about intersex issues because we don't have any epidemiological data. We don't know how the, the number, what are the metrics of this, but well, there is scientific based evidence demonstrating the importance, the relevance of investigating even more the nexus between intersex people and HIV and COVID-19 and the relevance of including intersex people and, uh, in HIV and COVID-19 responses. And I bring a short consideration about COVID-19. I'm almost finished. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought to intersex actors in Brazil the debate about the very notion of medical urgency, emergency, like medical crisis, what it means to live a public health crisis, because we already live in a public health crisis before pandemic, you know? And I, I, I say it because that's on the, that on, on the screen, you can see the resolution of the Federal um, Medical Council in Brazil, which uh, regulates the intersex genital mutilation surgeries in Brazil. And it states that the birth of a child with indefinite sex characteristics is a biological and social emergency. So we, we, when the pandemic came, we were like asking, well, what's our emergency, you know, because the official narrative says I'm, uh, I'm a biological and social emergency since, since I was born. And now we are, we are even more uh, impacted by the, the kind of emergency COVID brought, right? So, uh, and denialism and backlash during the pandemic has also a huge effect on how we responded to COVID-19 in Brazil. Because progressive movements were excluded from access to the federal government, to dialogue channels with the, the state. And therefore, they found themselves at the center of the health crisis with the responsibility to interpret and to manage it. So in the sense, they become involved both in disputes over the meanings of the pandemic and in advocacy and solidarity initiatives in order to respond the, well, to provide emergency uh, assistance, assistance, program, assistance programs. So social movements in Brazil began efforts to characterize this context and denounce government inaction regarding uh, emergency policies. At the same time, the network of intersex activists emphasized the contradiction of government institutions and sectors that on the one hand, treat intersex people's, people and intersex issues uh, as a crisis, as an urgency, as an emergency, and on the other hand, underestimate the seriousness of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need for effective and comprehensive health responses policy, health, health response policies. And because of that, we saw a beautiful combination, creative combination of ideas and actions, uh, mixing old and new framings and repertoires in the intersex network in adaptation to the problems and challenges brought by the COVID-19 pandemic in such a criti critical context. And I bring uh, this quote from Lia, and he says, that pandemic totally changed his life and his activist work. And well, for, for his analysis of Brazil, uh, we have witnessed setbacks concerning the rights that we had been able to advance. At the same time, I was desperate to go to UNIFESP, which is a university in Brazil, to get my genetic mapping done to access healthcare services, and I couldn't. And that has a lot to do with the pandemic. Services were suspended there at the moment. And when this breakdown, look at it, look at the code. When this breakdown in the healthcare system occurred, it was already broken for us. So now 
it's extremely complicated. So I bring that in order to narrate the, uh, the challenge the pandemic brought us. And because, well, the global AIDS strategy recognized the COVID-19 pandemic as a important shortcoming, important uh, constraint in order to people's access healthcare services, um, sexual and reproductive healthcare services. And it's, it's also true in Brazil, especially talking about that kind of context, so, so conservative, right? But I also bring um, some, uh, some efforts to counter narrate because in terms of disproportionality, the pandemic's impact on intersex people uh, impacted not all uh, impacted uh, the intersex activist network in both programmatic and operational terms because, well, they need to respond to the COVID nineteen pandemic and face the the difficult to be uh, because the, we are a network of intersex people who are facing the same issues during the pandemic, you know? So uh, the network has had to account for the damage of the COVID-19 pandemic and had to deal with the problems of being a network composed of activists who are intersex people equally subjected to vulnerabilities imposed to, by the health crisis. And we know about many, many constraints in funding terms. Gates, uh, Gates survey in partner with other organizations shows, for example, the, uh, the state uh, of, net, of intersex organizing uh, where the majority, like 90% of intersex groups operate with unpaid volunteer labor and very few have hired staff. So we have a difficult time in order to, to keep doing activism because people would say, oh, there is a quote of uh, a person I interviewed, uh, Sasha, she says, uh, they says, they said, these are, well, we have daily concerns because the government is not doing anything to help, quite the contrary. And this is a government that all LGBTI people were already, already afraid of from the very beginning. So the, the moment it was announced that he would be the president and then when the COVID-19 pandemic came, as time goes by, it has been getting worse and worse. And people would leave the intersex activism in order to just survive Brazil. <laughs> and uh, yet, we have a beautiful, beautiful example on how to counter narrate. I mean, we have difficult time, a difficult time in connecting to the state. And we have the repertoire of interaction with the state, like uh, this, uh, uh, entering elections and disputing uh, elections in Brazil is not very real for intersex people, except from Carolina, which is who's the first uh, intersex person to be a parliamentarian in South America. And she also lives with HIV publicly. And she also the only one publicly living with HIV to ever get elected in the sub in the subcontinent. And he's also a, a travesty, a transgender person, and one of the few 30 uh, elected transgender person in Brazil. So we are making our way there, right? And I mean, it's important uh, people, intersex people, has a seat at the table and can make policies for us. And she has advanced, uh, Carolina has advanced so much our 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 intersex policies in the in the in the city level. It's so important. We can see how what it means when we are seated at the table and what we can do there once we get there, right? So just some final considerations. Um, I mean, I bring uh, a concept I learned when I, when I studied in Brazil with, my, with a professor of mine called Daniela Contejo. And she talks about an ethics of dissatisfaction. And I'm unsatisfied. I, I need to do this ethics of 
dissatisfaction. Because this process I bring today can be considered a mimetic machine, to use Daniela Gontijo's word, of modeling and repetition that establishes the reference of normality, including corporal bodily normality regarding sex. Uh, and as Contigio says, violence is very expressive of power. And like all language, it stabilize, stabilizes as and, and actually reproduces itself with certain certain automatism and invisibility. And that's why I bring intersex issues at the HIV conference, because this automatism and invisibility, we reproduce the response to HIV, need to be changed in order to incorporate intersex people. Because, the, well, I mean, we, we are saying sex is as social constructed as gender. And yes, it is the classification of sex as a sexual construction, it is perfectly correct, but it does not divorce it from the biophysical evidence that it constitutes, you know, that it's the body vulnerabilities and body pot pot potentials that influence the conditions of political actors, right? At the same time, I, be I believe violent processes as a are raw material and contains the very tools for their own destabilization. So faced with the inevitability of this unstoppable repetition and ethics of dissatisfaction that makes social change possible is imperative. Our claim is for the guarantee to deliberate. Agents, capacity to choose and that's what colonialism took from us, BIPOC, queer, LGBTI communities. The commu that community needs to, be, needs to be able to deliberate, to decide, to be heard, because these capacities like agents, like deliberation, society, society took it from us and the state also took it from us as soon as we were born. And it has taken away from us every time an intersex person dies from depression, from anxiety, from of suicide, of a hate crime. And every time an intersex person is, is chained, normalized by the force of a scapel. Every time some institutions, uh, uh, we have time, uh, every time that some institution subjects us, people, intersex people to violence, to stigma, and to discrimination. And we intersex people are dying from the very cradle since we are born. Contrary to that, to that, to what they do, treating intersex, intersex issues as a private matter, which is what they do, as a secret, we have been able to say that intersex issues is a public issue and we need to guarantee life for us. It, we do that in order to guarantee life for us, in order to guarantee our, uh, the integrity of our bodies, uh, to guarantee life, long life for intersex people, life with all potential to live and to live in that space and time, in this world, in this life right now. And as I got to remind us, Oh, Segato is a very important professor in Brazil. She's from Argentina. And she says that the world has a debt with us, the debt to give back our history. That is, I mean, the cap to give back us the capacities of enunciation of our historical project proper to our body, regardless of its sex characteristics. And they state, uh, it's in society actually, they distributed with one hand uh, the truth of this perfectly dimorphed sex, but now th they need to return with the other hand, the guarantee of deliberating about the body, uh, the guarantee of the free and informed consent, the guarantee of a more livable life. And, we all have the responsibility. People responding to HIV and AIDS have the responsibility to choose life before death, right? To choose wholeness over mutilation, to guarantee autonomy and consent instead of compulsory imposition, to guarantee ethics before profit, to ensure science before morality, to choose human rights rather than their, rather than their 
persistent abuses and violations. And I'm so happy to collaborate and spread that message here today at the AIDS conference. I really hope we have more spaces like that in the future. And I want just to close my presentation with this, this quote I brought from a webinar we organized, we, hold, we held at Gate with six uh, activists from Latin America. And I asked them, we intersect people from the global South and from Latin America, who we are. And here's a compilation of what they said. We, the intersex people of the global South, are human beings. We are human beings capable of being loved and living a healthy and happy life without the need for our bodies to be normalized. We are the hope of a future world. We are complex people. We are dreamers. We are the hope of a future world. I repeat, we are living proof the system is not what they say it is. We are ungovernable bodies. We are a revolutionary factor. We are the very own responsible for our liberation from colonialism. And they gave us many different names except humans. And yet we are living resistance and we are resisting in the HIV response. Also. So thank you so much. If anyone have any question, I will be happy to address it in the remaining few minutes. I'm sorry I took so much time. I see one, one message at the chat. Yes, just yes. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't see any question. I think it is a wrap. Thank you so much. Thank you all for, enjoy for joining.